I love Rust for what it is. Seriously. For me, it's one of the most productive languages ever. Does it have a steeper learning curve? Yeah. Probably. But as soon as we've climbed that cliff, we can focus on the essential part of our job. Solving specific problems. I mean, instead of focusing on additionally battling our language of choice because it doesn't provide that many guardrails. Looking at you, multi-threading and concurrent variable access in Java. However, there is one feature in Rust that I particularly fell in love with. Extension traits. So let's dive in to find out what that is, how to use it, and why it's awesome. Shall we? When we write code in Rust, we usually try to solve a specific set of problems. And by doing that, we are often stuck with the APIs we have available. If we want to work with a list of things, we usually end up working with VEX, slices, and especially iterators. And they all have their specific APIs set in stone because they are implemented in the standard library or crates if we use alternative data structures. If we, for example, want to extract the first element of a VEC, we can call first to get an option that is either a sum if the VEC has a first element or none if it hasn't. If we now want to get the second, third or even fourth element, there is already no super conveniently named method available anymore. We can use get with index 3 to get the fourth element, of course, and that absolutely does the job. But the naming is still off, given that a method named first already exists. Admittedly, for some devs that might be a problem, for others it might not. We could also just use an iterator and use tuple destructuring to extract the element that we want from the beginning or even the end of our back. But let's admit that this becomes more cumbersome the further away the index of that item is from either the start or the end of the VEC. But what if all this is a problem for us and we want to do something about it? What if we just want the fourth element of our VEC with a single call without directly using get with an index, getting an iter and then the structure that with a tuple or use any of the other ways we could? One thing we could do is to create a function that takes our VEC as its argument and extracts its optional fourth element. But that's a different approach to all the other methods of a VEC. We would suddenly switch from using methods directly attached to the VEC to passing the VEC itself into a function. That's nothing too bad, but it somehow breaks the flow of our code, at least in my opinion. If we don't want to leave the more object-oriented approach, we can also create a wrapper type that takes the original type and provides implementations for additional methods we would like to have. Although we then have our desired methods, that API still isn't super great. We either have to make the inner type available via our wrappers API, so we can still call the original methods in some way, or we need to implement deref and probably deref mute, but seriously, that should be reserved for smart pointers, and it's debatable whether a wrapper type like ours really is one. So what else could we do? Well, whenever there is a feature in Rust that makes our lives easier, chances are high that it has something to do with traits. They enable quite a lot of Rust's advanced feature set, like closures, zero-cost abstractions, and more. And gladly, they can also help us make the process of extending existing types easier, through extension traits. In general, Rust allows us to implement a trait for a type if either the trait or the type are within our control, or better, in our crate. That's a quick, simplified summary of the orphan rules. In a case where we want to extend an existing type like a VEC, the type itself is not under our control, but we are free to create our own trait, which then satisfies these rules. A VEC is, by the way, a type a slice can point to, so we can even implement our extension for all slices instead of only VEX, which gives us more flexibility and lets more concrete types profit from it. For our use case, we can create a trait called sliceX and add our method fourth, which is meant to return the fourth element of just any slice. Its return type should be the same as that of get, which boils down to option reference t. Before we implement our new method, however, we quickly need to understand one important limitation. Technically, an extension trait does not magically break the rules of visibility modifiers. We can't suddenly access private fields of a type, and neither can we access private methods. Our implementation is forced to act as an external implementer, 
But that is also pretty good, because else extension traits could do a lot of bad. However, we can now provide a blanket implementation of our trait for all slices with the simple implementation of self-get3, which completely satisfies our requirement. From then on, we can use the newly created methods whenever we bring slice x into scope. This means that in module slice x itself is not implemented in, we could import the trait with a use declaration. After that, we can call the traits methods as if they had always belonged to the type they were implemented for. In our case, that means that we now have a method fourth available that we can use to get the optional fourth element of our VEC. And we can easily add more methods if we also want to access the second, third and fifth element and so on. Admittedly, that's a very simple example for an extension trait, but it should still showcase how the process generally works. In case you haven't noticed it by now, let me tell you something. If you've ever used as ref, into, from, to string, or anything close, you have already used extension traits. Those important traits from the standard library use the same technique to extend structs with additional methods and logic. The traits themselves create a common interface, so we can require a type to only supply a specific subset of functionality for our functions and structs, but they also separate logic that does not fully fit the theme of the base struct. This separation of logic is what the standard library, but also many crates use to not overload their APIs or provide additional optional methods for their own or other already existing structs and traits. Before you now ask yourself why the methods of asref, rom and co are always available without explicitly importing their traits, that's because they are all part of Rust's prelude, which is a set of automatic imports the Rust compiler performs for us. Okay, let's now take a look at a crate that makes use of extension traits to separate optional functionality. Tower. Tower is a library of modular and reusable components for building robust networking clients and servers. And it provides one simple core abstraction. The service trait. That trait represents an asynchronous function taking a request and returning either a response or an error. It provides exactly two methods, which are everything the abstraction needs to work. There are, however, a lot of common operations a developer might want to perform with the service. And this is why Tower offers an extension trait called Service Axed that provides adapters that implement a lot of these common operations. As all adapter logic only needs the two methods provided by the service trait to work properly, Tower is even able to just extend the base trait and provide a blanket implementation for all structs implementing service itself. Additionally, the trait is hidden behind a feature flag. If we don't want the utility methods, we don't need to care about the addition service X provides as they stay hidden from us. Only if we decide that we want these adapters, we can require the util feature of the crate and then import service X into scope with a use statement. After that, any service and scope has access to these new methods. Another quick example of a crate that uses extension traits is iter tools, which provides many convenient adapters and methods to extend the iterator from the standard library. The list of methods the crate provides is moderately long, but it contains many a little more advanced methods that one might miss when regularly working with iterators. Especially as the standard library usually advances relatively slow because there is a lot to consider when standardizing APIs and implementations that are going to be used by many developers for a very long time, iter tools often filled and still fills some gaps. We also only need to import the iter tools trait into scope and can then use all the methods it provides. And the great thing is that we can decide on a per case base whether we need the additional methods or not. Generally speaking, extension traits are a great feature because they offer a lot of flexibility for structs and their implementations. They allow us to extend existing structs with additional logic by making their usage optional because they only become effective when someone decides to actually import them into scope. Furthermore, they allow us to provide additional logic or utilities without overloading the API of the original struct or trait. Thanks to blanket implementations, we as the creators of a trait can even extend completely foreign structs or traits, as long as they fit the rules we define for them. 
This makes it straightforward to allow different structs and traits to also work with code and logic we create, although the author of a foreign struct or trait might never even have considered that. Additionally, using object-oriented approaches in Rust can make sense from time to time. We can, of course, always just create a function and take the struct or trait in question as an argument, but in many cases, attaching a method directly to a type just makes more sense. One drawback of extension traits, or the general ability to implement custom traits for any struct, however, is that methods can potentially clash. If two traits define the same method, both traits are implemented for the same type, and both are imported and used in the same file, the compiler won't be able to resolve that clash, as it can't decide which trait implementation to actually use. If that happens, the only way to deal with this issue is to leave the object-oriented approach of calling the method in question on the type and instead fall back to calling the trait function directly, passing the variable as the self-argument. This somehow negates the advantages of the object-oriented approach again, but that's a small price, given such a clash is at least not an unresolvable issue in Rust. Another issue of extension traits is that they invite us to quickly extend an existing type, although it might be better, in a particular case, to really go with a simple function or even attach the method somewhere else. But in the end, we also have that issue without extension traits, as Rust offers the flexibility of an object functional approach, where we can always decide case by case whether we want to use object orientation, a functional approach, or even a mix of both. One last drawback we need to talk about is that traits currently don't allow for const of ends. This means that any method added through an extension trait can't reliably be evaluated at compile time, if that would be possible. For our method fourth from the beginning, that means that it will most likely always be evaluated at runtime, even if we could have implemented it in a similar way to first, which would have allowed for it to be nearly zero cost in constant contexts. Although there are a few drawbacks to extension traits, I still really like them, and I value the ability to have a separate impl block per trait implementation. It allows me to separate my code into logical blocks and prevents struct implementations with hundreds of thousands of lines of code, not even counting documentation, only because someone thought that it would be a great idea to add everything to a single struct. Looking at you, Enterprise Java developer. Well, I still hope you also fell a little in love with extension traits or learned more about them. And hopefully you can use some of that knowledge in your next project. But hey, why are you still here? This video is over now. Come on, go coding. We'll see us in the next video.